I've entitled this morning's message, The Christian Life, A Battle and a Witness. The Christian Life, A Battle and a Witness. So although this morning we're only looking at two verses this morning, and you think, oh, the sermon's going to be short today. <laughs> we're going to be looking at two verses. We see that Peter, the disciple, and close disciple of Jesus, and writer of this letter, makes three clear points in these two verses to remind us and to challenge us as to what it means to live as a Christian in this fallen world. So we're going to be concentrating on three points in these two verses. So verse 11a says, I appeal to you, my friends, as strangers and refugees in this world. Um, that's an interesting phrase. And this is my first point from these verses today. Peter calls those to whom he was writing friends. Well, that's encouraging, isn't it? He's not calling us enemies to start with. He calls us friends. And this is an indication that primarily he's writing to those who are Christians, those who are already following Jesus. And uh, if you believe yourself to be a Christian and following Jesus, these words are especially to you. But if you are not yet following Jesus, don't close your ears because all of scripture is for all of us. And we can learn and be challenged by it. But he calls those to whom he was writing friends. He's writing to Christians, so bear that in mind. He also addresses them in chapter 1 and verse 1 as God's chosen people. So we know he's primarily writing to the people of faith. And uh, the Christians had been dispersed across the northern part of what we now call Turkey through persecution. And they were suffering, not because they'd done wrong, but they were suffering because they were followers of Jesus. They were refugees because the place where they found themselves was not their home. Uh, they were in a place where they didn't fit, where the customs and traditions were not what they were used to. They were strangers, they were aliens, they were refugees. I think these things are very significant. If you are a born-again Christian, if you know that the Spirit of God has woken up your heart and you've discovered the truth of the gospel, that without faith in Jesus Christ you are going to a lost eternity, then you are a born-again Christian. The Holy Spirit has entered you. And now I need to tell you that you are an alien in this world. If before you became a Christian you were settled and you were ever so happy and so on, I now tell you that since you became a Christian and a follower of Christ, you are now an alien and a stranger in this world. As followers of Jesus, we don't fit in the fallen world in which we live. Christian faith does not fit in this fallen world. We are aliens in this place and strangers. Any of you identify with that? You feel a stranger, an alien in the world, yeah? in your workplace, in your street, when you watch the television, etc., etc. We are those of, whose eyes have been opened by the Holy Spirit and our hearts are set on a different place, the heavenly destination that God has prepared for those who know him and who love him and who follow him. We're going home, folks. <laughs> Aren't there some days when you look at the news and, and you, you see the mess that's around you and the brokenness and you think, we're going home. And doesn't it look so inviting? Paul had to struggle, he says in one of his letters, I want to go and be with the Lord. You know, I can see heaven opening up. I can see home approaching. But if I have to stay in this world because God has something for me, then so be it. But he had this, this heavenly home set before him. He was, he was going somewhere special because he knew that he himself was an alien and a stranger uh, in this fallen world. We don't fit in that sense. Um, but here and now we're God's people in a hostile world. That's our position. We are citizens of heaven. We're not citizens 
of uh, Great Britain or any other country that we count as our home country. We are citizens of heaven. So we say that, we are citizens of heaven. And the citizens of heaven, it's the place where righteousness prevails and God will be eternally glorified in everything. That will be wonderful, won't it? Now 1 John chapter 2 um, says this, do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. This isn't just the planet we live on, by the way. This is the whole world view, the whole package. Uh, do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. But because everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father, it all comes from the world. The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever. See, we know something that the world doesn't know. A wonderful, it's an open secret, but many people's faces are veiled. They don't see it. We pray for a breakthrough by the Holy Spirit into people's lives. This world, with all it has to offer, is not our home. It might be that when you became a Christian, suddenly you were strangely not at home. You suddenly felt awkward about things, different from what you felt before. It's because we are only strangers, refugees, uh, on our way to our heavenly home, the place that we can truly say, finally, we've come home. It's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? Even in the world, you know, when you go away for a holiday and you... You enjoy it, but when you see your front door and you know you're going to sleep in your bed, and <laughs> it's a lovely feeling of coming home, but imagine that infinitely greater. And we're going home, and we're no longer going to feel like aliens and strangers. We're going to be the place where we always belonged, the, heart, the one that God has opened our hearts to by his Holy Spirit. So that's the first thing. Peter appeals to us as friends, Christians, followers of Jesus as strangers and refugees in this world. We're citizens of heaven, where righteousness reigns, and we're on our way home. Praise the Lord. The second thing he says is this, I appeal to you as strangers and refugees in this world, <coughs> do not give in to bodily passions which are always at war against the soul. It uh, sounds a little bit old-fashioned, the language, doesn't it? You know, giving way to bodily passions. Um, maybe it sounds old-fashioned because these days people don't give in. Uh, people give in quite happily to all the bodily passions. We're so used to it in our world, in our fallen world, that it sounds old-fashioned to hear Peter say this. Well, what's it all about? Well, Peter is saying our eternal destiny depends on us taking this seriously. Do not give in to bodily passions which are always at war against the soul. Now, these words will only really make sense to you at all if you are a born-again Christian, if you've been wakened up to the gospel. Some of you know that before you became a Christian, so much of this was just normal to you, your normal behaviour. You didn't think twice about the things you were getting into. You didn't think twice about the goals that you had for your life or the things you wanted. Suddenly everything's changed. Uh, you only understand this verse or begin to when you are born again, when you become a Christian, when you become a follower of Christ. Our eternal destiny depends on us taking this seriously. Why? Because the gospel according to this world Get what you can for yourself. That's the norm, isn't it? If you feel something, then go ahead and do it. That's the maxim over these past few years, in our country at least. You know, you have the right, if you feel something, to do it. God forbid if we keep going down that road. It's amazing what we do now that even 20 years ago, we wouldn't have even thought it was right. But now we're all rejoicing in some of those things. It's incredible how things are changing so fast. We're, we're going farther and farther away from, from what God has told us to do. 
what an incredible thing to preach as a gospel. If you feel something, do it. You're free to do it. Do whatever you feel. Imagine the horror that could come from that. And we see the horrors around us, don't we? Don't hold back. Follow your instincts. You know, if you've got a, a feeling, then you can't help it. That's what you were born with. So go ahead. You know, do, do. Follow that through. Um, the world is calling you every single day to follow its gospel. And don't think we're the only ones that have a gospel to preach. The world is preaching a gospel to you every single day. It calls you through the loud voices of uh, parliamentarians, maybe, particular parties, pressure groups. It calls you through advertising. Uh, I'm a bit of a watcher of ad advertising. I know William gets bored of hearing me quote adverts, but it's a real education. One evening, I, I challenge you to watch all the adverts and actually think, what are they really trying to get us to do? What are they trying to get us to be? What are they trying to get us to own, to aim for? You know, they say things like there's no money around at the moment, but they still advertise televisions that cost three, three four, five thousand pounds. You've got to have one of these. We can make it possible for you because we can give you lifetime payments back. You know, you can't afford it, but we'll, we'll let you have a television because everybody needs a television the size of your bedroom wall. Catherine and I laugh sometimes because when we first got married, we had a 12-inch portable black and white. And uh, you had to sit a little bit close to get the full picture. But now you need a bicycle to, to go from one side of the screen to the other. It's so big, isn't it? You can't just look. You have to go... Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so big. We all, you need one of those, didn't you know that? You're not really living today unless you've got one of those. How could you possibly watch Sky Sports on a 12-inch portable black and white? That's no fun, is it? You need this. Um, advertising, media, and the images they show, they're telling you these are the norms of society that you have to conform to. You can spot them if you look carefully on the other. I'm not going to name them, but I'm not going to get into trouble this morning, but you can watch them yourselves and you can see the norms that they're telling you you have to believe, you have to conform, you have to follow. The world is preaching a gospel to you every minute of every day. When I was uh, at art college, we did a survey about advertising. We went on the street and we said, do you think you've ever been uh, influenced by any advertising? Oh no, never, never, never. Uh, we know from statistics that advertising is powerful uh, even though you don't know it's happening to you you are being evangelized by a world that is broken and lost and turned away from God and half the time we don't even recognize it um, don't forget the big telly you need of course you need an electric car now <laughs> you've got to dump your petrol car you've got to get an electric car It'll only cost you starting at about twenty-three and a half thousand um, pounds. Soon, well, if the cars go up much, we'll have to be living in those because we can't afford the houses. <laughs> Do these things, and you will live. The world says you'll experience real life, and the world will push you. The world will tempt you. The world you will entice you any way it can with promises of wealth, or happiness, or gratification, or comfort, or status, it'll tell you, you absolutely need these things. You need to be doing these things. You have to conform. There's a saying, isn't there, that we often use, and I don't think Christians should ever use it. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. That's not a Christian phrase. It shouldn't be on our lips at all. We're in this world and it's messed up, so we'll be like it. That's what the saying means, doesn't it? When in, when in a fallen world, behave like a fallen human being. No, this is not Christian. But the world says, fit in, follow the crowd. That's not what the scriptures say to us at all. The scripture says something completely different. It says, be different. Be a challenge to the culture in which you live. Challenge 
these things that are wrong. And you know, Satan will do anything to stop us from knowing peace with God for us to inherit eternal life because he has this vindictive attitude towards the God who threw him out of his heaven for his rebellion. So he's going to take as many of us down as possible with him to hell. Uh, James writes, people are tempted when they are drawn away, drawn away, trapped, trapped by their evil desires. Uh, then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's what the scripture says. So much in the world calls us to follow its gospel and to turn away from God, and we might be tempted. We might be tempted. I don't know if you remember a man, he's 76 years old now, Ilya Nastasi. Anyone remember Ilya Nastasi? One or two. <laughs> he's a Romanian man and he was, uh, back in the day, he was a world number one tennis player. And uh, he was one of the top ten players in the whole world and winning countless titles. Um, he was the first sports professional to be signed for sponsorship by Nike. Oh, what a wonderful man. How incredible, brilliant at tennis, winning tournaments there in the International Hall of Tennis fame. We look up to him and we bow down. And of course, he is worth millions, or certainly in his day, the millions he was worth were very significant. He was also known for his foul language, his foul language and his behaviour on and off court, his abusive att attitude towards women. He was thrown out of tournaments, barred from others. He married five times and divorced and allegedly slept with more than 2,500 women. He denies that. He says it was probably nearer 900. <laughs> There'll be some men who go, oh, yes, please. Isn't it true? You know, some people would look up to him and envy him. This. He's a celebrity in the world. He's held up as this amazing man for his tennis playing, etc. The world preaches, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. But Jesus said, for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You may ask, so what's wrong with enjoying everything the world has to offer? Well, the things we're talking about uh, in their rightful place are there for us to enjoy. You know, just to say this, uh, uh, Satan didn't invent sex, for example. God invented it. But he said, the place where you are to share that intimacy is within the fellowship of marriage. Uh, and it's a lifetime commitment. Um, but in that context, I give it to you to enjoy. Um, Satan didn't invent it. <laughs> but Satan has twisted everything that God has given us that is good. You may ask then what is wrong with enjoying these things, but Peter gives us the answer. He says, these things are at war against your soul. When you follow the gospel of the world, you follow your passions and desires, and that is your goal and your aim and your joy, then your soul is at risk. Your eternal self is at risk. Your eternal destiny is at risk. The world says, I'm free to follow my passions and desires. And then we ask each other, don't we? Why is everything such a mess everywhere we look? Why is there so much chaos in the world? Why is there so much hate? Why is there so much brokenness and pain? You know, if I were to ask a poll of all of you in your private lives, is there pain and brokenness in your story? Many of you would say, yes. You know, I've been abandoned by this person. I've been abused by this person, etc., etc. Because the gospel of this world is a lie. Uh, what it promises, it doesn't deliver. It's attractive enough to entice us, 
and to tempt us, but it leads us to death, eternal separation from God. That's what Peter says. That's why he says it's so important that you hear this and take it on board. Paul also writes in a similar vein in Romans 12. He says, So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you'll be able to know the will of God, what is good and pleasing to him, and is perfect. Wonderfully uh, explained there by Paul, isn't it? Um, one of the other versions says, do not let the world squeeze you into its own mould. Which is again a lovely picture. When I was a bit younger and going out preaching from college, I used to go to village churches and, and preach on that passage and I would take a mould, a rabbit mould and some jelly and a kettle and I'd get one of the deacons to, to make the jelly while we were waiting so that they could see the jelly being moulded into the shape of the rabbit. Yeah, exciting days, weren't they? <laughs> But what a wonderful picture. The world is squeezing you into its own mould. And Paul says, don't let the world squeeze you into its own mould. Um, let God transform you. Then you'll be ready for this eternal destination and eternal home is prepared, prepared for you. Peter says, do not give in to bodily passions. Why? Because they are at war with your soul. Your eternal destiny is at stake if you follow your passions unchecked that's the second point third point verse 12 your conduct among the heathen should be so good that when they accuse you of being evildoers they will have to recognize your good deeds and so praise god on the day of his coming uh, that's a, a wonderful picture i don't know if you've found that often being a christian and standing up for certain things or doing certain things people don't say thank you so much for making my life better. They often say, you're weird, uh, or, or actually shun you. Um, uh, many stories over the years, a, a lady who uh, refused to get drunk uh, and have an extended lunch every day with the rest of her workforce, politely said, um, I'm afraid I'm just gonna stay here and get on with my work. Um, and uh, for that, they uh, victimized her. They started taking pieces off her typewriter. You remember typewriters? Uh, taking pieces off her typewriter. So when she tried to do her work, it would fall to pieces and the boss would tell her off for not completing the work. The world doesn't like Christians. It doesn't like the Christian message because it's opposed fundamentally. Satan is the, the God of this world and God is the God of the kingdom of heaven. The two often don't mix. If you're a Christian, then you're a privileged person because the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to see the truth of this gospel and to see the world as it really is, as God sees it, as a broken, desperate place. You have a new status in Christ. You're a child of God, a citizen of heaven, chosen by him, loved by him. And on your way to the place prepared for you in his heaven, the place where we can truly call home. But now we're in this world, we are to be witnesses for God. This is the third thing that Peter says. Instead of living like the world, and you know, even in Christian circles now, it's becoming almost a virtue to say, look, we've got to adapt the gospel. The world has changed. We've got to take on board the things that the world does. And we've got to be as near to them as we can so we don't frighten them. William and I and, and Isaac went and we heard a lady, I won't say who it was, uh, because I'm sure she does lots of good, but she was saying, you know, in order to get young people in the churches, which we haven't got many of at the moment, we've got to become more like the world, so that they'll say, oh, that's nice, the church is no different from us, we'll go and join. Well, at the expense of our souls, at the expense of our messes that we have. Um, Sometimes you make it almost a virtue to be like the people next door, don't we? 
We say, oh, we're no better than you. Well, that's not about being holier than thou. It's about being a witness to who we are in Christ. We're not under the rule of Satan. We're under the rule of Christ. We're going to clash with the world, folks. Jesus told us, in the world you will have trouble. Um, He didn't say people will be begging for you to come and share your life with them. No, he said, in this world you'll have trouble when we're witnesses for God. Um, We're looking in uh, 1 John at the moment in our Bible study about walking in the light. You know, we should be walking in the light. Christ, because light pushes the darkness away. Paul, writing about his before and after meeting with Christ, he says, (coughs) tells us what he used to be and what he used to treasure in life. And he seemed like a good average man, very religious, trying to honour God and so on as a Jew. Uh, He says about what he used to treasure, I count it all as loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Um, I count it all as loss. We've been set free from the power of sin over us. That should make us rejoice. But this very freedom compels us to live in a way that God gets the glory, um, not Satan. This is in opposition to the world. The kingdom of this world stands in opposition to the kingdom of God, That's the battle we're in. Um, That's the witness that we have to make. Peter tells the believers that this world will not like them for being different. And so it is. The world will not like you for being different. Um, Indeed, the world will hate us when we speak out against adultery and say it's always wrong. The world will hate us when we say that sexual license is not what God wants us to live like. It'll think that we're weird if we are faithful in our marriages. You know, if you say, I've been married 20 years or whatever, people go, oh, that's amazing. And uh, other people feel judged by it. Oh, are you saying you're better than us? 50 years, Bags and Peter have been married. They still love each other. They've been through ups and downs and challenges and they still hold hands in the sermon because Jesus is at the centre of their marriage. The whole society should be applauding and saying, well done. You're an example and a model to us. No, often people feel judged. Are you saying you're better than us? (laughs) The world will think us uh, weird if we have long marriages and we're faithful. It will try to silence us when we challenge the killing of unborn children in the womb. It will consider us stupid if we make a point of paying all the taxes that we're supposed to pay. It will protest against us when we declare that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. There's a battle that we're just starting. Goodness knows where that's going to go. Be ready for it, folks. It's hotting up. We are aliens and strangers in this world because we belong to God in Christ. And the world doesn't. The world generally will not welcome our witness when we walk in the light because light exposes darkness. But we're living to seek and bring glory to God. Amen? Look what Peter writes will happen on the day when Jesus returns. He says, Your conduct among the heathen should be so good that when they accuse you of being evildoers, um, they will have to recognise your good deeds and praise God on the day of his coming. That's strange, isn't it? I think that means that although they, because you've done this or you say this and they go against you and all that kind of thing and think you're weird, when Jesus comes again, they will have to have their eyes open. They'll have to say, actually, you lived wonderfully. And they'll have to praise God. Um, You know, it's a bit like in Psalm 23 we were looking at, you know, uh, I have prepared a feast for you in the presence of your enemies. It's a bit, going to be a bit like that. When we get to heaven, we won't be the weird ones and the strangers and the aliens. You see, we, we Christians are the normal ones. Because it's God's world. And um, if we're walking with him, we're the normal ones. It's the rest that are weird. Um, 
Here's a thought. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you're called to do battle against the world's passions and desires that motivate us and press on us so hard. Because your very soul depends on this. And you're called to be different. You're called to walk in the light so that the false gospel the world preaches will be exposed as the lie for what it is. And people will turn to Christ and God will be glorified. Amen.